For tonight, I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction, <clears throat> other than a jokester, um, about myself. But when I when I come in to talk, it's almost like this has been a very big setup. As I'm listening to the worship, as I'm listening to the things that Joe's saying, it's right in the vein of where I am going to be speaking tonight. Um, but I, I very much, if you know me personally, I love to have a lot of fun. I, I love to enjoy things. Um, but then I also love to and desire to be very successful. And so I can very uniquely toggle from being 100% jokester to being like in, intensely serious true. all in the same time. And, um, and so sometimes I've come here and I'm, I'm joking around, I'm doing things, and, and Eve's like, Mark, what, what are, on earth are you doing? <laughs> uh, Eve is my wife. Um, which is why she has that permission to speak into my life. Um, but I want to um, start, this is just a fun story on, on something, and this is a, it's a faith and family night, so I'm going to talk a, a lot about faith and family, and I was talking to my son Jackson this afternoon, and uh, we, he was like, what, what are you going to talk about? And I was like, well, I'm going to talk about faith and family, and he's like, and nights. <laughs> faith, family, night, I see what you're doing there, Jackson, good. So he's 15, and I have so much hope. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, but I shared this at men's conference. I don't think I shared this uh, here with the group. So this is a repeat from men's conference. But, um, you know, I'm always trying to find different ways to, you know, find fun and insert it into different moments of our lives. And we were doing a trip down to Virginia Beach last summer, and uh, we made a stop, a convenience stop in Philadelphia on, on the way down so that my wife could go shopping at the mall. And, um, and so we're there, we made a stop, and she's in TJ Maxx, and then I take my three young kids, and right across the plaza was a cookie crumble. And so we said, exactly, I've never been there. I was like, we've got to go to cookie crumble. Let's go, guys. So we walk in there, and there's like an iPad that you have to fill out your order, and you enter, you know, you select your cookies, and then you have to write your name for the order, and then, and then you pay and you move on. Um, and one thing about myself, a fun, fun fact number one of the evening is uh, my grandmother is from Norway, and my middle name is Hans. And like a true American, I never use my middle name for anything, so you would never otherwise know my name is Hans. Um, and for those with little kids, my sister's middle name is Anna, so we, oh, it's like this Frozen show. <laughs> um, and so I'm there, and I'm fill I, we pick out the cookies, and you have to write the name for the order. And I'm like, this is perfect. I'm writing Hans. Yeah. So I write Hans, and my two daughters, Scarlett and Savannah, look at me like, you're crazy. <laughs> They're going to call Hans. I was like, exactly. So I, I answer Hans, and, um, and we're going, and we're waiting. It's just, it's just me and the kids, and then this guy on the other side of the store. And, um, you know, we're waiting not too long, and they say, cookies for Hans? And it's like my big moment had come. I was like, Let's go. It's cookie time. So I go up and they open up the box to show it to you. Like it's like a fresh pizza at Nurchies. You know how they always do that? Like, come look at the cheese pizza. Like, have you ever rejected the Nurchies pizza? Like, I don't, that's not enough cheese, guys. I don't know. Like, they always show you like you have authority there and you're kind of stuck. Um, so uh, she shows me the cookies. And there were six cookies in the box, and there were four of us there, and we only ordered four cookies. So my first reaction was, the favor of God is chasing me down and has bestowed upon me two additional cookies. I was just like, this is it. Like, I get favor, and the evil tell you, I say it all the time, favor's just chasing me down. Here we go. And she says, and, uh, and we'll be right up with your other box of four. And I was like... And next thing I know, the guy comes over. He says, I'm Hans. I think those are my cookies. And he goes to get the box of six cookies. And I'm in, where, where were we? Plymouth meeting, Philadelphia. I was like, Hans? <laughs> and he looks at me. He says, Hans? <laughs> He's like, actually, Hans. <laughs> and I was like, well, it's nice to meet you. I said, yes, I don't meet Hans. <laughs> and so we had this whole interaction. And this cookie store is filled with two Hanses, which I'm sure has never happened in the history of Cookie Crumble ever. My kids are sitting there like, what is going on? <laughs> 
and the guy leaves. And I, I genuinely, I'm like, was that an angel? Like, I'm here playing a joke on my kids with the name Hans, and I'm like, I bet he's laughing. Like, I'm going to send an angel to go be Hans, and I'm going to out Hans you. And I was like, I can't, I can't get it. But it's like, it's so easy to find little moments to make special with your kids. And, and that was just like, it's such a silly thing. But like, I'm going to put Hans as my name. And it's just like, it, it meant something. And if I were to ask my kids, like, can you describe to me what we did on that vacation? Like, maybe they'll remember two things or, or that. I mean, that was just it. And I was like, well, here we go with everything that you do. And you plan about getting there on time and going through all the stressors and everything. But just have fun with it. It's, it's easy enough. Um, so, and, and I have another example um, that I wanted to share. That's just like a fun story. And, um, and this one is more of a, a funny, embarrassing story. Um, I had, um, I, I like to, you know, find different ways to be successful in the work that I do. Um, I, I'm actually, fun, fun fact number two, I'm a full-time worker, CEO of a local company in town here and work like really, really cool like things in the healthcare industry. And I'm always trying to look at like how, what are different ways to be successful in the work that you do. And I got caught up a few years ago and I, maybe it was a reel or something, but it was one of these like, you know, fun fact, if, if you drink a lot of water before a meeting, you'll sound more convincing when you're making your case and your argument because you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and, and you're like so ramped up to get out of the meeting, you're gonna be more convincing than ever. And um, I had the bright idea to try this out. <laughs> and I underappreciated how long this particular meeting was gonna go and how much water was too much water. And I miscalculated on both sides. And I must have ended up looking like a complete jerk because I was in this meeting and I was like, I couldn't leave. And I was just like twitching, like get me out of here as quickly as possible. Um, and I'll come, I'll come back to that because there's, there's strategies in the flesh that sound good, <laughs> but, they're, but they're, not, they're not that good. And we do a lot of dumb things sometimes. Um, so about myself, I came to this church in 2002 um, as a freshman at Binghamton University. And um, that's, as I look at that, I'm like, that doesn't make sense that it's like 20, 20 something years ago. Like that, that just doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Cause Gary Clark hasn't changed in 20 something years. You want to see when, when we, when it's true. That's a, that's a testimony. So when we bought this building and this thing was totally different we were removing all the ceiling tiles and just, you know, cleaning stuff up. And there we found, we weren't expecting it. It was a full rope in the ceiling up here that just dropped down. And Gary Clark pulls on it. He's looking at it. And he just starts pulling this, no legs, all the way to the ceiling. And I was like, I was in shape. I was on the track team at BU. And I was like, Gary, that's, like, really impressive. You know, good for you. <laughs> um, but it's, it's come a long way, and, and I just, I look at the journey of, of all the different things that, that I've encountered in life, and like, you know, for me, I really desire to represent the kingdom of God with an unwavering strength. Like, if, if I were to, like, put something inside of, like, my inspirations and my goals, like, I want to be an unmovable representative of Christ. Like, th that's, what I, that's what I want. And I look back at all the different things along my life, testimonies, different faith journeys. Um, there's a lot of different things that have been implanted and, and rooted in me that help drive and sustain that. And I'm glad that Joe started uh, this evening with sort of like a mock altar call. You didn't have to come up, but he was giving a call for salvation because there's a lot of different kinds of lessons. There's, there's a lesson and an evangelistic message that's going to reach out and try to, try to pull you in to the faith or restore you in faith. Um, there, there's teachings where you might explain through, here's the scripture, here's the Greek, here's, we're going to uncover what this means. And what I'm really aiming at today is how to position you and give you clarity and get rid of confusion in ways that might cause you to waver. So that's where I'm, that's where I'm digging at. That's, that's where I'm digging at. Um, so, uh, 
really, really funny. I think it's funny now. But uh, a few years ago, 2019, uh, my wife and I were both ordained up here. And uh, there's a pile of ministers and a few different people. And one of the ministers, Dee Dee, said, um, you know, you're going to be, you have a blessing for business, you have a blessing for ministry, and there's going to be moments where you're just, you're working, and you don't even have time to prepare, and then you have to show up, and then you have to speak, and he just goes on, and I remember hearing that, and at the time I was excited, and, and, and then the more I thought about it, I was like, oh no, <laughs> what do you do? why would you say that? Uh, but I've appreciated it, because if that is a message, it means the Lord's entrusting you with something. And my, my wife can testify, this week, these last two weeks, these last three weeks, I've had the busiest schedule at work. It's like <laughs> phenomenal. So just to say, like, for those of you that were here, that word is, is very, very much true. So anyway, I'm going to go and, and start to break into um, the message here a little bit as as I go back and look at, you know, my testimony and, and how I grew up and, and different ways that God was reaching out to me and touching me along, along my faith journey, if you could call it that, um, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't like I had this moment in Christianity, like Charlton Heston standing and parting the Red Seas, and it was this big monumental moment. I look back and I'm like, I remember this tiny thing that happened to me when I was six years old. And, and that was a pivotal step. And then I remember another thing as we went along, and it was all of these incremental, really important moments that, that I, don't, I don't forget. Like if you were to say, Mark, what was a really important thing for you in, in, in your walk with God? I'd point to these things that otherwise you would look at and be like, well, those don't really seem all that important. And I want to give, I want to give focus to those things because as our children go through them, we can't have that same, like, oh, that's not really all that important. It is a very significant thing in, um, in their life. And, you know, for one of them, um, growing up in the 80s and 90s, we had VHS players, and there was no, for kids, there was no cartoons other than Saturday mornings. Like, that was it. And we had, uh, among a handful of VHS cassettes, we had salty the singing songbook, which is the most, I, I watched it, it's on YouTube, I watched it the other year, I was like, I wonder if they have that, oh, they have it, and it is not as cool as I remember when I was growing up, it is an eight foot, foot tall, like, songbook that sings and dances these ridiculous songs, but that's all we had. So I listened to this one tape was just on repeat or The Little Mermaid. It was just, if you, I could quote every line from The Little Mermaid. Um, but as we go through Salty, there's this song, and it, it says, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. And I heard that song five, six, seven, eight times a day, almost every single day. And the criticality of having the spoken word in your kids' lives constantly makes a huge impression. I walked around, and I didn't always have a good attitude. But sometimes my mom would say, Mark, I need you to vacuum your room. And I would go to vacuum, and sometimes it would click, and I'd say, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be a servant of all. Mom, can I vacuum your room too? You know, and, and it, started, it started to click. It was just so repetitious. It was so available in my life that the word began to manifest out of my life. I began to adopt a servant's heart in the things and ways that I approach situations. And I look at that and I think that was a very, very powerful thing to have been introduced at such a young part of my life. How many, how many people expect to be served and not be a servant. It's a complete, if you take the whole, this is my truth, this is me, it's all about me. It's all, it, none of it is about service. It's a, yeah. Never do you hear about service. So I just, I point back to that, and I'm like, that was such an important piece. So encouragement number one, speak the word with your kids relentlessly. They get it. And if you don't believe that that works, watch any of our kids that go through classical conversations. It, it, it does, it does uh, truly work. Um, Another one, I may have been like six or eight years old, and um, at the time, 
the end times were a big thing, apparently. Um, and it was talked about all the time. And I was also, like, thinking, in elementary school, we would do bomb survival drills. They would set off, like, this nuclear bomb siren, and you'd go into the hallway and then crouch and put your head between your knees for 30 seconds. And then they'd say, okay, you're ready. Let's go back to the classroom. <laughs> you, know what, you know what to do. But I look at it, I'm like, what a ridiculous way to grow up. Like you're doing bomb <laughs> drills in elementary school. All the adults are talking about the end times. And I remember talking to my grandfather one time and he's like, you know, cause I, I always ask him questions and go through things. I was like, grandpa, what's like one of your biggest regrets in life? And um, he was born in the 30s, so he's from a you know, generation before me or two. <laughs> And he says, I wish I went to college, but the reason I didn't was we thought the end times were coming. And I was like, yeah. oh, my gosh. Yeah. This isn't just going on now. This was going on in the 30s and 40s where a message of fear gripped and crippled him into I'm going to hunker down and not do anything. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Wow, that's crazy. So... Anyway, so th this is just the moment that I was in, and I had a dream one night. Maybe I was six, maybe I was eight, but I was, I was a younger kid. And in the dream, it wasn't too high up, maybe just like the height of the ceiling, there's an, a, a cloud, like a pancake kind of flat cloud with an angel on it. And I'm outside, and I look up. This is my backyard. And it was like, it was the most like religious looking angel of all times. Just, <laughs> you know, that was it. Just, and he summons me, and I float my way up to the cloud. I remember looking up, and I was like, am I dying? <laughs> and he's like, no. I was like, okay, good. And, um, and he says, you know, I'm going to send you back down, um, but never stop praying. And then he sent me down, and I woke up. And I remember that dream, and, and that, that moment, that dream, that message, never stop praying, stayed with me for years. And there were seasons where we would go to church, seasons where we wouldn't go to church, but I was, I was constantly getting plugged every now and then. Mark, never stop praying, never stop praying, never stop praying. And that was just, it just became a constant reminder, like, okay, I'm, I got to turn to God, I got to turn to God. Um, and these are all things at a very, very young age. So now, I'll, I'll go to my kids in the morning, and be like, hey guys, how was your sleep? How'd you guys do? Did you have any dreams last night? You know, because I'm like, I'm like, Mary, I want to put it in the back of my soul, in the back of my mind. Like, okay, what, what's going on? And 99% of the time, it's like, I had a dream, and I farted, and, you know, like, <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's just hilarious junk. You know, but I want to listen, because I'm like, I understand that they can be spoken to in their dreams. And I want to, as a parent, I want to be alert to it. Yeah, and if I, don't, if I don't ask, then I might not ever yeah. know what is going on in their lives. So I've got to intentionally try to talk and pull those things out. So anyway, I'm, I'm looking at faith and family, and um, the, the, first, the first main point I want to really make is, is, an, emphasis on, is an emphasis on family. And if you, if you go back and you look at the scriptures and you look at just like the reality of this message, it can get very, very confusing for people. And the confusion can, like, cause a big separation. And one of the biggest confusions that I've seen is the connection between the spirit realm and the natural realm and where I am right now. And even if you just go to the very start of Genesis, it's like, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, the Word was with God, but He wasn't flesh. He was a spirit. And you go through this whole thing, and then he creates the world, he creates man, and everything that we do naturally is to try to identify God with the physical things that, that we can see. If you go back to like when you were a new Christian and you're, you're trying to relate to, to the spirit realm and understand what's going on, it can be confusing. It's like you, we have these, you know, all these statues and, and Zeus and mythology and all this kind of stuff, and it's like you want to understand the spirit realm without boundaries of time, but, but yet yeah, we're bound by time, and, and, we, and we, we try to go through all these things. And Jesus was confronted with it. Um, they're up on the mount, and, and the crowd says to him, how, how should we pray? You, you're bringing us this revelation, this great message. How is it that we should pray? And he says some of the most profound words, if you take a moment to look at them. 
He says, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who is in heaven. And that is one of the most radical ways to start a prayer. Because if you were to go to the Pharisees or the Sadducees or men and women in the natural, I don't think they would go there. You know, he didn't say, when you pray, pray this way. O Lord of lords, O God of gods, O Lord of thunder, <laughs> O mighty, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> the, the heavenly mist, you know, there, there's no, he, he didn't go there. He didn't, it wasn't an impersonal thing. He wasn't, you know, it was like, it was a collective, our father. It wasn't like, okay, hold on guys, like, okay, James, when you pray, you can say father. Judas, when you pray, you know, you need to work on some things first. Then you can say, our Father. There, there was no stipulation. There was no rule. There was no, well, guys, guess what? Before you pray, you should come do these things. It was, they said, when, when we pray, there's this, there's this God in the spirit realm who we can't see, who we can't touch. And you're telling us the kingdom's at hand. How do we pray? And he said, our Father. And... That's where I'm like, these, these worship songs are a total setup because all these songs are like, I'm a child of God, I'm a son of God. And that's, that's the message of sonship in this church that, that caught my attention in 2002. When, when I first came here, it's like I grew up and I had gone to, I was like, a, a, I went to like a Methodist church, I went to a Baptist church, like I went to like all these different churches growing up. And I had, I had faith in me, I had a little bit of an understanding of sonship, but I had this, it was so tightly wound up this, this works mentality where it was like, I'm forgiven, but if I haven't done enough, now I have to go back and redeem it. And um, one thing that happened to me growing up, my, my sister was really disabled. She couldn't walk. She couldn't talk. And it was always difficult for us to be able to get out and, and be able to go to church. And so sometimes, like, we'd go to church for, like, two straight months, and it was like, we're doing good. And then it was like, we haven't gone to church for four months. And it was like, she's having seizures. There's, we're changing meds. Just all kinds of stuff was going on. And we couldn't go. And I remember like thinking to myself, like, okay, never stop praying. That's great. I'm going to have to do an altar call when I get back to church because I haven't been there so long and I'm letting God down. And I had this, you know, I, I felt bad, but I was like, I, I must not be a Christian. I'm not, I'm not doing good enough. I'm not even going to church. You know what I mean? Like I had that... It was very, very much a, um, a works mentality about it. And um, that, that's where the enemy tries to fracture your confidence. You can be told, I'm a son of God, I've been forgiven. You can do the altar call, you can do, you can do all those things, right? You can come to the Lord, and then he'll challenge the basis of your salvation. Like, immediately we'll try to challenge it. And here I am, a kid, like have no control about how I can go there. My mom is doing the absolute very best that she can, and we're getting there as much as we can, and yet I'm feeling this condemnation, which wasn't of God. <laughs> that's, the key, that's the key point. And the enemy will try a, a wolf in sheep's clothing to try to get you off of your foundation. And in 2002, I came to this church and heard about the, the Malawi Orphanage, and we still, at that time, we were, we were given coins on the first Sunday of the month, and I remember coming here, I'm, I'm 18 years old, just, just a freshman at BU, and I, I had my bag of coins, and um, <laughs> we would, Bill, you're probably a part of this too, we would actually uh, beat each other up with our coin bags in the dorms, <laughs> and then we would come and give them. And we, had to, we were getting hurt, so we had to call a pack that we wouldn't <laughs> hit each other with our, our uh, socks of coins anymore, um, which is a whole other story. But um, I remember I came one Sunday, and I had left uh, my coins at home, and I was so condemned. I was like, how, how could I forget coins for the orphans? I... I must not be as good of a Christian as I thought I was. Like, I, I, I've, I've missed something, and I'm going to have to self-reflect what I'm actually prioritizing because I've forgotten my coins on campus, and I have no car. I'm totally relying on KJ, so I'm not even going to go back to the dorms till later tonight anyway. Um, you know, but, like, I, I felt that. 
And I was like, how, like, how much better of a situation could you get? Like, as an external observer, it's like, well, a freshman man at Binghamton University at 18 years old is trying to go to church, yeah. is setting aside an offering over the course of the week, has a heart to serve God, and then is coming to give the offering and feels terrible that he forgot it, and the enemy comes in and says, you must not be good enough. Yeah. You know, it's so ridiculous. And I, I told this story to my kids the, the other week. We were just chatting, and I was like, oh, man, like, you guys, this is, this is what happened. And it opened up a whole conversation of ways that they felt condemned. And um, Jackson was saying, well, it wasn't this year. <laughs> but it was a, it was a, this is a while ago. <laughs> it was a while ago. Um, but I was in worship, and my eyes were closed. And I was singing the song, and I forgot one of the words. <laughs> and I thought I really let God down. And I felt really upset about that. And that's, that's the voice of the enemy that tries to condemn you and take you off of your position of sonship. Here is a young man under the age of 15 um, who has figured out if I close my eyes and worship, I can eliminate these obstacles and I can try to reach for God at a deeper level. And he's singing the words to the song. He forgets one word. And then the enemy swoops right in. You must not even be a Christian. Whatever he said. Who cares? This happens to everybody, though. You think it's just me? This is the stuff that happens to every single one of us where I'm, I have salvation. I'm, I'm committed. You know, I'm, I'm relying on the gift of sonship, and Christ has died on the cross, and I accept it on my behalf. It's not about my works. Yeah, but you forgot one word in worship. It's like, and you buy into it. You've, you went to church for two months, and you stopped going for two months. Well, I might as well not go back. You know, that's, but people buy into that, that lying voice that's trying to take you off of your position of sonship, take you off of your position of your relationship with God and make it about your works. And it's so perverted that he'll use an offering for the Malawi orphans that a freshman at Binghamton University has set aside to try to dethrone. It's like, it's crazy. It's crazy. So anyway, I didn't even know that Jackson had that happen to him until I talked to him about it, until we were opening up dialogue. So I'm coming back to, I said this on a, on a Sunday morning, we were doing the announcements and dismissing the kids, and I said, take some time to talk to your kids, because they don't know anything, and you have to instruct them, and you know, I was like going down this whole road, and uh, man, the kids gave it to me when I got back home later that day. <laughs> I think I had like my kids and Mark's kids, and they were like, Leeson, <laughs> Leeson, Leeson was the one. He looked at me, and we know stuff, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> I was like, you do, Lisa. And I, I'd like, like work my way around, be the fun uncle, you know, ruining it. <laughs> um, so we did. I was, I was talking to uh, Savannah. I was on the back deck this afternoon, and I was, you know, talking. I said, oh, Jackson, I'm going to use that, that story that, that you said a few, a few weeks back. And, and Savannah was there. I said, Savannah, I never heard from you. Did you ever have something like that happen where, where, uh, where you felt like you, you let God down? She's like, Nope. Not once. <laughs> I was like, well, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, I, I look at this and I'm like, as I, as I strive to build on this stuff, I'm like, okay, as, as a son of God, I've got to live like a son of God. And like, what's the point of being forgiven if I'm not going to live and act like I'm forgiven? You know what I mean? Like, what's... What's the point of salvation if it's not going to produce life in me? What, what, what's the actual point? Like, I look at this, and I'm like, I, I'm not going to let these feeble attacks of the enemy try to derail me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be strong and stand on the things that the enemy is trying to do. Um, another, um, another kind of pet peeve of mine is, um, is jealousy and insecurity. Like, if you want to see a Christian become a not Christian very quickly, just introduce one of those two things very quickly into their life. And you'll see, like, 
you know, a, a loving person. It's not even a Christian. It's just like those two things can flip somebody um, very, very quickly. And um, within the realm uh, of jealousy and insecurity, it is exactly the first thing uh, that, that the serpent tried to do with Adam and Eve. You know, they're in the garden, connected with God, one with God, made in God's image, you know, literally living as, as the first people. And he's like, what's, what's my trick? What's my angle? How am I, how am I going to get at this? It's like, oh, oh, you can eat everything? Well, what about, what about that one? Yeah. What about that one over there? Mm-hmm. Oh, you can't have that? It's because he doesn't want you to be like him. <laughs> right. Ooh. And we're in this society today, peppered with social media. Be like them. Look what they have. Look what they have. And we take our position of, I'm grounded, I'm with God, I have all, all of this, this promise and authority, and then you look at something else, and it's like, well, but I don't have that. And that's, the, that's like ground level, like the first trick in the book, is he'll try to come and, and deviate. And, and I'm not going to go into... Uh, you know, go into the New Testament, but there's literally scriptures about, you know, you are the body, and if you're this one body part, don't be jealous of this other body part. It literally, the word literally says, don't engage in this sort of thing. And um, when it comes to, um, you know, acting and, and functioning within the body of Christ, um, and, and, you, and you get into this, it's very important to know that you have a calling exactly where you are. And, like, when I, I don't have to come up and try to be like Pastor Chris or be like Terry or be like Tony, I just have to be me. And that is the, that simplifies it so, so much. And what the enemy wants to do is to make you think that you are not good enough. And, like, what Pastor Chris will say a lot is, like, you know, my goal is to equip you because you are a minister. And I know it. What, what the enemy's immediate reaction is, but you're not a good public speaker. And, like, that has nothing to do with what he's saying. <laughs> like, I want you to know, when Pastor Chris is saying, I want to equip you to be a minister for the kingdom of God, that means a lot of things. Case in point, there's a lot of contractors ministering out here <laughs> over the past few months helping us out with things. Um, KJ, does it, he's up here. You can't even see him because he's serving. Is that KJ? Is that Paul? He's just, it's KJ. I can't see. These, the lights you've put in are amazing. KJ, <laughs> KJ ministers to this church via technology. And he doesn't do it with this church. He goes to Wysox, and he sets them up with technology. He goes to Auburn, and he sets them up with technology. He goes to Panama City. And you can't tell me he's not a minister. But when Pastor Chris is up here saying, I want to equip you for your ministry, you immediately disqualify yourself or you allow yourself to be disqualified because you think it means you have to stand up here and teach about, you know, a dissertation in Hebrew. And that's not what it is. (laughs) Unless you happen to have a Ph.D. in Hebrew... That's not it. (laughs) Um, So don't let yourself get sidetracked uh, by this concept of jealousy. I'm not good enough. I don't have that. I need that. You just need to be you and bring you where you're at. And my my grandmother, uh, we called her Grandma Pecky because my last name is Ropecky. And so she was Pecky. Um, Grandma Pecky did the most ridiculous thing growing up. Uh, It was Easter Easter Sunday, we had lunch, all the cousins are there, and uh, they set up the desserts, but all the grandkids went into the, the table to have, have the dessert first, which was kind of fun. And there was an Easter egg at each table, and it was like, oh, Grandma gave us an Easter egg. And so she, she said, okay, everybody sit down and uh, grab an egg, but you can't change your table, or you can't change your seat. So we all sit down, and we pick up our eggs, and some people, you know, shaking them, trying to see what it's jelly beans or whatever. Some people were shaking it, and it was coins. And you were like, this is money. I know what's going on here, Grandma. Um, But then other people were shaking it, and there was nothing. And you were like, oh, no. (laughs) I really want those coins. So the immediate reaction was like massive jealousy over the people that had coins. And it was about half and half. 
And so she says, okay. She's like smiling. Everybody, we're going to go one at a time around the table, and you're going to open up your, you open up your egg. And so first person opens up their egg, and it's like four quarters, which is gold. <laughs> I was like, I got four quarters. <laughs> I was like, that was it. The next person opened it up, and they got four quarters. And then whoever comes to me, I open it up, and I had a dollar bill. Instantly, my feeling of upsetness over jealousy left, and I instantly felt pride because a $1 bill is way cooler than four quarters. And I was like, you can keep your four quarters. I've got a dollar. <laughs> and we go around the table, and halfway through, there's a, there's a lot of us. It's not like a scrinzy family, but there's a lot of us. And we're going around the table, and somebody opens theirs up, and it was a $10 bill. And I was like, I didn't get that one. But she was intentionally setting us up, and it was, it was almost the same. But there was maybe like one $5 bill. Somebody got $2. Somebody got $1. But the lesson was to be happy for your cousin and to be grateful for what you got. And I'm not saying to do that because you got to be ready to back that up. <laughs> if you're going to play that game, you're messing with fire. But... I was like, you know, we spend so much time with our kids, like, hey, let's pray, let's pray, um, let, let's, let's lay hands on that injury. Like, we, we try to activate faith, yeah. but I'm like, <clears throat> other than saying don't do that, how do you train children how to not be jealous? Yeah. And I was like, I, I get what she was doing. Be, care, be careful how you approach it, but I think it is important as parents to spend time how to teach children how to overcome those feelings of jealousy. So if they can't overcome it, you see it as adults. Like you see what jealousy does and, and the games and, and the misdirection and all that kind of stuff. And like the evil stepsister of jealousy is insecurity. And like they're two different things. But insecurity is like being a son of God isn't enough. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm a son of God, but I don't feel like I'm good enough. And insecurity will just like it will really, really cripple you down and completely stop you from being able to be progressive um, because you don't think that you're good enough. You're lacking something. Maybe you can say, I lack nothing. Okay, I lack nothing. Therefore, you cannot be insecure. But um, I remember when I got my first job, I graduated BU. Um, I did this biology program. Um, and then I got into healthcare consulting and um, moved down um, and worked in the city. And in this consulting firm, everybody was an accounting major and pursuing their CPA. And we would go around, you know, the, the tables and the orientation. And I want to say, like, 95% of everybody was an accounting major. 5% um, of the rest were, like, econ or business majors. And then I was the, I was the only person with any other degree, let alone a non-business degree, uh, of biology. Like I had no accounting courses in my background and I'm sitting there and it felt very intimidating because ev every single buddy in that room has this complete background and knowledge that I did not have. And then we we're going to go, you know, go do audits. <laughs> and I'm like, well, they know a bunch of stuff that I don't know. And I needed at that time either it was like, well, I'm in over my head and there's nothing that I can do about this. I just don't have the right background. Or I could believe that, God, you've positioned me here, and you're going to give me solutions for the things in front of me, and I'm going to walk forward day by day and just solicit you for the guidance and the things that I need. And what I can tell you in that is, although I was very fortunate and lucky to get in there with the degree that I did, um, by the end of the second year, I was rated the top consultant in the firm um, at, at, that, at that position. And I was like... Well, maybe you got to hire some more bio degrees. <laughs> you know, but it's not, about, <clears throat> it's not about wisdom in the natural. It's about drawing on your father in the spirit. And it had nothing to do with, like, I was, like, drinking water before meetings and sounding really convincing. You know, like, it had nothing to do with a, a natural preparation or, or, or even, like, the way that the world would tell you to prepare. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with the fact that I knew in confidence I could handle the situations that would be placed in front of me because that's my promise. 
And so I'm going to walk into this position, and I'm going to carry the mantle that's been put before me. And that's one of the things about Christianity. It's not about not walking through the fire. It's like you are going to walk through the fire, but you're going to do it, and you're going to be able to sing praise. You're going to walk through the fire in your life, and you're going to have joy. You're going to walk through the fire in your life, and there's going to be fruits of the Spirit manifesting, and that's going to be a testimony that people look at and can recognize. Um, you know, that's, that's probably one of the biggest miracles of Christianity, is that you can walk through the fire in your life yeah. and have peace. Amen. Like, that's it. That's the truth. Because the rest of the world, when, when the fire comes and the trouble comes, it is a complete unhinged moment. Like completely, completely unhinged. But the fact that the world can look at you and look at your testimony and say, you know, I, I see this trial that you're going through, but I see that you're coming through. Like that is one of the most powerful things that will be reflected in your life. And um, even to, you know, the mother who's trying to take their kids to church and, and it's it's once every two months, or it's this, this, or that. Don't let the enemy discredit it. God is going to bless the seeds that you sow into your family, uh, even absent your religious idea that it's got to be each and every single, um, each and every single Sunday. So, well, it's 7:40. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to add in just a few more things. Um, these were a few notes that I, I didn't know exactly where to put them, but um, one one encouragement is that um, our God, our Father, has a measuring system. And it's described as being pressed down and shaken together and overflowing. Yeah. And if I'm going to be a representative of Christ, I can't have a I do the bare minimum to get by mentality. I've got to adopt the measuring system of my Father that says I have a pressed down overflowing measure that's going to come out of my life with the things that I do. And out of that, people are going to be blessed. So it's a challenge. What, what's the measuring system that you hold into your life? Is it, I, I seek to do just the bare minimum just to get by, or is it a pressed down measuring system from your father that's been bestowed upon you? Um, I don't know. It looks like I said everything else. Um, Woo! Um, so in, in wrapping it up, those, those are some of the things. Don't, don't ignore or take for granted the things that God is doing in your life. Right. The enemy wants to take the testimony and, and dilute it. That's, that's not a major testimony. Share it. People need to hear your testimony. People need to hear your voice. And um, if, if you've been an observer, if you've been... Um, an observer but not a participator, there's a big call to action to begin to participate. There's a big call to action. There's a big difference between understanding in my head that I'm a son of God and participating as a son of God. And I remember Colton shared this on a Wednesday night. He says, I was coming here for like two or three years, and, and it finally clicked. He's like, I had to start serving. And he says, the moment that I started contributing what I had to contribute and start serving, he's like, it opened up. So I, I challenge you, if you've not found a way to participate, it's not ministry. It's not like standing here and, and giving, giving a word or giving a lesson, but find, find that place to participate. And you'll be really, really amazed to see relationships, uh, to find yourself get connected with people that have resources for you. And that's how the body works. It's like, if Mark is stronger, I'm stronger. I applaud Mark's successes because it's my success. I, I applaud Bill, Nate, Joe. Like, I want to see you guys thrive and succeed. <laughs> They're sitting over here, like, doing it. But I want to see you guys succeed, just like you guys want to see me succeed. So, <clears throat> anyway, I encourage you in those things. And, um, and that's all that I have for tonight. So, I'll call back up Joe for the wrap. Thanks, Mark. Um, one thing I love about Mark 
is that he's a challenger of the practical. He really is. He, he takes the truth and he says, well, this is the truth. How does that work on the lower level? How does that work when you go to your job or your occupation? How does that work when you're parenting or you're coaching or you're doing anything? How does, how does the principles and the life of Christ manifest through every part of your life? So that's really the main thing I got. And um, also another thing is that the enemy likes to have the smallest foothold. It's the smallest thing. It's not, it may not be like big and scary and I don't want to tell them anybody thing. But maybe it's kind of like what it was in worship where you're like, I can't do it because I forgot the words. <laughs> like, and I think we have to confront those small things because they become bigger. Um, and sometimes it's harder to see it because we're like, oh, we, we have to know all the words. We have to understand all the scriptures. And no one's asking anyone to do that. God's into the long game. You'll be okay. <laughs> it's small progress. It's like the world has understand this principle, but he, our father, had it first. Like, it's the little it's a little, little leaven that leavens the whole thing. It's like, so, thanks, Mark. And uh, my encouragement for you for the week is progress is still progress. It doesn't matter how small it is. If you used to get angry at people and you don't get angry no more, that's great. If, you, if, there's, a, if there's a situation in your life and you've been walking with Jesus and the situation would normally make you snap and you haven't, Congratulations. Because that's progress. He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for his own perfection to work itself out in you. He's not looking for your moral success. He's looking for his life lived.